And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Hey! Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on film. I mean, who is it? It's really sweeping the nation. I mean, look how many people are watching this right now live on Twitch. 8.2 thousand. Sure, the screen only says that like two or three are showing, but that's just liberal bias for you. How many can this room hold? I mean, that's the question oh. I have. I get worried and like, what happens when it hits maximum density? One time last uh, year, back when my wife would regularly stream on Twitch, she, she, uh, she, we got on and we were just drinking and spending time together. And, uh, we ended up getting like, like a thousand people watching us just really? randomly. Yeah. Uh, one of my daughters explained it to me that sometimes a popular room will be streaming and then the room will shut down. So then the, whatever system will say, Hey, now that you're done, here are some other rooms you can go into. And one of them just happened to be uh, Natasha and I drunk uh, streaming. And so that was weird, but yeah, it, you can get, you can get some people. Uh, okay. Uh, no doubt you're a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on film. I mean, who is it? But only the true fans, the real hardcore fans who have been with us since day one would know the two basic facts about the both of us. Two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, Bunny and Steve. First and foremost, Bunny, is the fact that when you're not doing this podcast, you work with crocodiles, which always blew my mind. So tell yes. me, Bunny, how do you get started in the field of crocodile hugging? Crocodile hugging. Um, it, <laughs> it is, it is, it is just from my deep, deep love of crocodiles, uh, that makes me want, cause they're the ones that have the, the pointier snout. That's the yes. crocodile. Uh, they often don't like being hugged. So you have to kind of sneak up on them, jump on their back, and get in a really good hug before they try to take your face off. Because whereas I am a big fan of crocodile hugging, that does not go for the crocodile themselves. It's very yeah. sad that, you know, I wish they could open up more, you know? And feel so. free to express their feelings and be who they are and and feel comforted by a hug. But unfortunately, that is not the case. So uh, sometimes there are tranquilizers that are involved in the hugging process. You know, basically. Huh. For you or you, for the crocodile? Well, basically, Hello. you have to roofie the crocodile. You know, to get in there and get a good hug. Uh, or, you know, what not. Yeah. You know, uh, once, once they pass out, one thing leads to another. Who exactly. knows? Exactly. Uh, and forget about it if there's a full moon out. Yeah. Uh, that one was written by Mac by the way, just to let you know, my 11-year-old came up with uh, the crocodile hugging. And the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I do at this point of the podcast is I found a story. I find a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and reword it via my own special, unique storytelling style. And that is what this segment is, another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximations! Dun, 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 dun. 
or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone else likes likes it or not. Now, personally, I like the name Shap. I just think it sounds cute. Uh, now, small programming note. These Shaps are not 100% exactly what happened in history, primarily because I enjoy putting words in people's mouths. So I would say it's about 93.7% exactly what happened. It's like they say, yeah. 50% of the time, it works every time. Yeah. Anywho, this week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be discussing a famous TV personality, the TV game show that they pissed off, and the birth of pop psychology. This is going to be fun, but first, semi-unrelated, but also somewhat related. Can we both just pause this chap so that we can take a moment to shit on Dr. Oz? Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Although the chap has me intrigued quite a bit. But okay. yes, please, let's uh, take a big steaming dump okay. on Dr. Oz. Fuck Dr. Oz. He's not even, he's not, he, and, and he had people voting for him to be, you know, a representative of Philadelphia. He's not even from Philadelphia. He's not even from America. No. It it drives me nuts that people were like, oh, President Barack Hussein Obama, he's not an American, he's a foreigner. But then those people will happily vote for Cuban-born Ted Cruz. Yes. And non-American citizen Dr. Mehmet Oz. That blows my mind. The Republican hypocrisy. Yes. That'd be a great name for a band, Republican Hypocrisy. One, two, three, four. Uh okay. So this <laughs> chap is a this chap is about a woman. And for suspense purposes, I will be censoring the first name, kind of like our last chap regarding the invention of Salisbury Steak, which I really loved. So her name for the beginning of this chap is J. Diane Bauer. She was born in Brooklyn in 1927. Hey, I'm birthing here. <laughs> so I, I'm really proud of that. I was really happy to, to do that. Fun fact, this famous TV personality, her father raised her and treated her as a boy, even going so far as to call her by a male name. So, famous TV personality, secret trans icon, non-binary hero, the argument could be made. Anywho, she double majored at Cornell with honors, then went on to Columbia University, where she got an MA and later a doctorate in psychology. Psychology. So now, she's going places, two degrees, an MA, degree, and a doctorate. So it's safe to say that Dr. Bauer, super smart, crazy smart, hella smart. We're clear on that, right? Yes. Okay. Now let's put a pin on that. Put a pin on Dr. Bauer. And we are moving on to an old school, old timey game show. Specifically, the $64,000 question. Okay. A wildly popular TV game show in America, which aired on CBS from 1955 to 1958 until a scandal forced it and all of the big money game shows off of the air. I'm not going to get too deep into the game show scandal because what happened in this particular shop happened way before the scandal broke. But the gist of the scandal was in the 1950s, the most popular thing on TV were big money quiz shows. There were a ton of them. And surprise, surprise, a bunch of them were rigged. The most famous one being the NBC show 21 and handsome man Charles Van Doren beating fat loser Herbert Stemple. Yada, yada, yada. There's a movie about it. I really like it. It's from 1994 and it's called Quiz Show. You should watch it. It was nominated for four Oscars and won zero. Well, 1994's Ed Wood won two Oscars, which is one Oscar more than Pulp Fiction won on the same year. And I will mention that every freaking chance I get. <laughs> but anywho, 
a lot of the popular big money quiz shows were rigged in one way or another, where it's like, okay, we're going to ask you these random questions now. Just kidding. They aren't random. We're picking these because we're trying to F with you. Um, the $64,000 question wasn't an, an exemption, an exception to uh, a lot of these game shows being rigged. One of the big issues with the big money game shows of the time was that you, it, 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 we're in the 50s here. Uh, TV hasn't been around for that long. And back in the day, back then, a television show's sponsor had a lot more say in what was on the show they were sponsoring. It's it's not just uh, the $64,000 question. It's Revlon presents Yes. the $64,000 question brought to you by Revlon. You know, so... So in the case of the show 21, the sponsor Geritol was all, look, this Herbert Stemple guy, he's really smart and he keeps winning. And uh, he's like a genius. The only problem is he's ugly and he sweats like a whore in church and the audiences don't like him. So we need to get him off the show, either force him out, pay him out. Get him to lose on purpose. Give the other guy the right answers. We got to get this big, sweaty behemoth off of the show. And that brings us back to the $64,000 question. And it's sponsor, Revlon the Cosmetics Company. Earlier, um, before the $64,000 question, Revlon's rival was named Hazel Bishop. Apparently, they were a cosmetics company, or still are. I don't know. Okay. But uh, Hazel Bishop sponsored the show This Is Your Life, and that made Hazel Bishop a crap ton of money. So the head of Revlon signed off, signed off on being a sponsor for the $64,000 question. Now, I'm looking up the history of Revlon, and I was sad to see that the founder of Revlon was a guy named Charles Rebson. That pisses me off. You would think it would be Charles Revlon. No, it's Charles Revson. Yeah. Then why is the company Revlon and your Revson? It just kind of pisses me off. So for the rest of the chef, we're going to rename him. Funny. What is yes. the name of the founder of Revlon? Uh, Charles okay. Revlon. Okay. Charles James. James. Von Revlon, he's from the old country. Revlon the third. Okay. And so, he has and a loves. dueling scar. Yes, yes. His grandfather was one of uh, 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 Scotland's premier horse masturbators. And that's ah. what started him in, in making blush and lipstick. So, so as everyone with Ray Meland. Ray Meland. Of course, the Ray Meland horse erotica that this uh, podcast is so fond of. Now, everyone knows that the founder of the Revlon Cosmetics Company is a man named Charles James Von Revlon III. He's from the old country. So Charles James Von Revlon III, he has control over the show, the $64,000 question. And he is just like, okay, if we're going to have people on this show, let's get beautiful people. Beautiful people that represent my beautiful cosmetics company, Revlon, named after me, Charles James Von Revlon III. So uh, we want beautiful people to be on and win this cosmetic-sponsored game show. And now go ahead and go back a few minutes and unpin the pin from before because Charles James Von Revlon III is about to meet his worst nightmare, a highly educated young woman from Brooklyn who never wears makeup. It's our girl, Dr. Bauer. Of course, it's uh, the 1950s. 1955, I believe. And and so our girl, Dr. Bauer, has uh, met, 
has settled down and married a doctor named Milton, and she took his last name. So by the time she appears on TV screens nationwide, she's not Dr. Bauer. She's Dr. Joyce Frickin' Brothers. Boom! Big reveal. Oh. I'm a pickle, Morty. I'm a pickle. Yeah. Dr. Joyce Brothers. So the $64,000 question in its first year. It's in its first year. And so far, only one contestant has won it all so far. Dr. Joyce Brothers, at this point in her, in her life, is 28 years old. She's a doctor. Her husband wants to be a doctor, is also like a med student sort of a person. But at the moment, he is a medical intern who is only making $50 a month. Plus, Dr. Joyce Brothers has had recently uh, given birth to their first child. So Dr. Joyce Brothers and her husband, Milton, both have a three-year-old daughter. But he's only pulling in $50 a month in 1955. They are broke AF. Yeah. They're basically living in poverty. They are destitute. Uh, I don't know what people, what poor people did in black and white. Sold pencils on the street, I think. Sell papes. That's it. And uh, I, I don't know what else they did, but super Pretty sure it's just prostitution, the same as always. Yeah. So they're living, they're basically destitute and they're desperate. So she decides to try and become a contestant on the $64,000 question. She sends in a letter that explains who she is, sends in a picture. She gets an interview, and at the $64,000 question, the way they did it was they would get experts, professionals, doctors, experts in various fields, but they would be quizzed on things that they were not experts on. Uh-huh. So, so the producers and the Revlon people would be like, okay, so you are a celebrated musical composer. Great. We're going to give you a list of things, and you can choose which one you would like to be quizzed on. Dog breeding, cooking, um, underwater basket weaving, that sort of thing. So it would be like if I was on the $64,000 question, I would be quizzed on the NFL or the Fast and the Furious movies, or I'd be quizzed on having a small penis. I don't know any of those things. <laughs> I don't know. The first thing about any of those, I would be lost. So, like, like, uh, what would you be quizzed on, Bunny, if you were on the $64,000 question? Oh. What is the opposite of funny? I, I would definitely be quizzed on the NFL cars. Catholic Saints, maybe? There's a shit yeah, I'm not that bad with Catholic Saints. Okay. Not great, but not bad. G.I. Uh, Joe characters? And the uh, rock band Kiss. That's it. Fucking Kiss. Um, the thing that I love about Kiss, the only thing I love about Kiss is that they said all four members of the band are going to make their own album and you can buy them all at the same time. Like anyone is going to buy a Kiss album that is not like Paul Stanley or, or uh, Hyman Wiss, whatever is it. Why do I know his real name but not his actual Gene Simmons? Yes. But if you get all four of those solo albums that they released at once, the only song that anyone even remotely knows is uh, Back in a New York Groove, which I believe was done by the bassist or the drummer of Kiss from his solo album, Peter Chris. Oh, man. And it's a cover. And it's the only, out of the four albums, that's the only one that's the only album that I believe had a song that charted. 
I find that fa- I love that song. There's a deleted scene from Infinity War where uh, Thanos kidnaps Gamora, and so Peter Quill is unsure what to do. So he's just in his ship listening to New York Groove over and over again. Because apparently that's like his thinking song. So he's just listening to New York Groove over and over again. I'm back. Back in a New York Groove. And so finally Drax gets pissed off and takes the cassette off and they start chasing each other around the ship. Put that song back. I am sick of listening to these people. So I love New York Groove. Um, So Dr. Joyce is given a number of manly topics for her to pick from. Uh, basically, uh, the founder of Revlon, who of, whose name, of course, is Charles James von Revlon III, he was like, hey, le- all right, let's give this dainty, fragile little snowflake of a housewife some real manly topics to choose from. This lady never wears makeup, so this way, We'll give her a bunch of manly topics she knows nothing about. That way we can make sure she loses, because I don't want this non-makeup-wearing hag to be on my cosmetic show. Okay, toots, here are the topics you can choose from. Football, baseball, scratching your balls, listening to Joe Rogan, never washing a pair of jeans, and, I don't know, friggin' boxing. And so Dr. Joyce Brothers chooses boxing. Okay. Her topic is boxing, and this is how the $64,000 question would do it. Okay, so your topic is boxing. Good luck. We'll be taping in about a month. Okay. So, Dr. Joyce goes freaking beast mode. She, she's got a photographic memory. So, she tracks down a 20-volume boxing encyclopedia. And reads that bitch cover to cover. She studies boxing with boxing journalists and a former Olympic gold medal winner in boxing. She gets years and years of old issues of Ring Magazine and reads those cover to cover. Beast mode. Plus, her uh, intern husband loves boxing. So by the time of the cameras roll, our girl basically is the Michael Jordan of Evil Knievels of Mike Tyson's of Stephen Hawking of freaking boxing. (laughs) Now, to be fair, she has a massive knowledge of the sport of boxing. Sadly, we never got to see her box. No. So, uh, but I think it's safe to say that with her insane boxing knowledge, well, I think she can knock Dr. Ruth on her ass. Oh, yeah. I and think, that's the I fight think, uh, I would like to see. Yeah, I do. I do think that, like, she has a photographic memory. She did so much studying. She, she basically is the female Mike Tyson. But yes. she just decided never to get into the ring and bring the hurt. Like, even though we never saw her fight, you know that she would have kicked ass because she's got skills. In much the same way, I've also never seen Martha Stewart sneak drugs into a prison by shoving a bag full of drugs up her asshole, but we know she can do it. Yes. She's done the time. Yes, she has. She knows how to pass a kite from one cell to another to get the good shit. I'm just saying. (laughs) So she goes on the show. And then back then, this is weird. I, I learned this, and this this blew me away. Unlike game shows now, it, it wasn't just one show, one episode. Here's one person. We are going to add, be asking all, all of these questions in one thing. No, it would take weeks of episodes for someone to win. It would take approximately five episodes for someone to win it all on this show. They ask you questions like, oh, here's the $5 question. Here's the $12 question, yada, yada, yada. By the time they get to the 4,000s, I don't I, I need to track down some episodes of the, the original $64,000 question because I have a hard time believing this. 
But according to Waikapadaya, when they got to the 4,000 range, they would just ask a question an episode. Really? How the heck do you do that? I don't get it. But anyway, that's how they would do it. So we would take five episodes for someone to win it all on the show. And remember, by the time Dr. Joyce Brothers gets on the screen, only one person has ever won the $64,000 question. So uh, imagine the anger of Revlon's founder, who, once again, his name was Charles James von Revlon III. He's from the old country. Because he's having to see five whole weeks of a woman not wearing makeup on Revlon's hit game show. Yes. It's driving Charles James von Revlon III from the old country, the founder of Revlon Cosmetics, driving him up the frickin' walls. So he gets pissed, and he goes, all right, sick of seeing this makeup list lady on my show. We got to rig this shit. We cannot have a woman with no makeup win my game show. Yes. So this is what Charles James von Revlon III, the founder of Revlon from the old country, this is what he did. He changed the question from boxing questions to very difficult, detailed questions about refereeing boxing matches. Okay. Trying to catch uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers for a loop because that's how pissed the founder of Revlon is about Dr. Joyce being successful. Uh... But did that stop our girl, Dr. Joyce? Heck no. She nailed it, of course. Every question. And would go on to become the second person ever to win it all in the $64,000 question. And here is a crazy postscript to this story that I did not know. Okay. So Dr. Joyce Brothers is considered the most famous person to ever win in the $64,000 question because she parlayed that into a long-time TV personality career. I mean, in the 80s, she was everywhere. Her and Dr. Ruth were just everywhere in the 80s, and, and she was just a well-known name. But, um, so, I am blown away with this. Dr. Joyce Brothers, boxing winner, in the $64,000 question, one year later, she would get a TV show but not what you might think. In 1956, she became the co-host of a sports program called The Sports Showcase, meaning Dr. Joyce Brothers was one of the first female sports commentators ever. Wow. I had no freaking clue. At all. That blew me away. You mean to tell me Dr. Joyce Brothers was a famous sports announcer? That blows my mind. But yeah, I guess it makes sense because she won in the boxing category. So she would like be chosen to like, hey, come over here and uh, announce this uh, Sugar Ray Leonard fight. And she would go and do that. And then af after... And how uh, exactly uh, would she feel about that? Like, I guess it's good to have a job and probably a good paying job. But it's not like she really likes boxing. Yeah. No, her husband likes boxing. But, like, I'm not going to become a master of supernatural because of my wife. Amen or but, okay. But, uh, yeah, isn't that crazy? And then after she did the sports show, then she got an advice column, and then she got a uh, a TV show and started going on shows like Hollywood Squares and Johnny Carson's Tonight Show and whatnot. And Dr. Joyce Brothers became a widely successful TV personality. She is, at this moment, credited with being one of the first people on television to explain 
complicated psychological terms to the general American public. That ne- that thanks to Joyce's brothers and her columns and being on TV and being on the Today Show and Hollywood Squares and this and that, she was one of the first people to be out there with normal people saying, hey, um, your psyche, your inner turmoil, inner child, all of these sort of things. A lot of the the psychiatric terms that we all know now, she kind of helped popularize those in the public yeah. consciousness. Uh, and yeah, she she went on to become a wildly successful TV personality, but it all started with a broke mom on a fairly crooked TV game show. Dr. Joyce Brothers was a rags to riches freaking badass. Yes. I I am shocked by this awesome story. You, when you think of Dr. Joyce Brothers, you don't think of like, man, she was like waiting in line in soup kitchens and stuff. Struggling to keep her family fed and desperately went on a game show in a way to make a little bit of money and yeah. turned mm-hmm. into America's top psychologist. Freaking good for you. You go girl. Hashtag girl <laughs> boss. Dang. And uh, I know that this is something that I normally say at the end of every shap, but I am shocked that people don't know this story, that people don't know more about how much of an awesome badass Dr. Joyce Brothers was. This She's awesome. Yes. Yeah, Hats like uh, the Dr. Joyce brothers. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Ruth was everywhere, but like she was a lover, not a fighter. Yes. <laughs> uh Dr. Joyce brothers, she would she would fuck up a bitch. This is true. This is true. Yeah. So that is it for Steve's historic approximations this week. Be sure and join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with Steve's Historic Approximations! And cut on that.